Hello, and on behalf of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's Office of Sustainable Housing and Communities, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar. My name is Rula Swice, and I'm the Director of the Division of Grants and Procurement. The topic of today's webinar is Match or Cost-Sharing Expectations for Sustainable Communities Initiative grantees. As you know, match commitments are an integral part of the Sustainable Communities Initiative. They represent serious commitments on the part of local partners to invest in long-term integrated planning processes. Such processes and their resultant outcomes carry the potential to transform communities in positive and meaningful ways for generations to come. And we're pleased to say that the Sustainable Communities Initiative has reached over 150 communities and regions throughout this country and tribal nations. Match commitments also represent a significant return on the taxpayer dollar. Many projects have matched their HUD grant award amounts at 50, 70, 100, and even 200 percent levels. With a small or moderate federal investment, many of you have taken tremendous steps to lead and sustain the type of long-term change that will improve the quality of life for so many people now and into the future. OSHC is committed to being a strong partner to you, and we seek to support your success in as many ways as possible. As such, we found it important to take some time to focus on match expectations. My goal today is to ensure that you have access to the guidance, information, and resources to continue implementing your projects in a manner that is both locally relevant as well as in alignment with key federal regulations. I hope you find this webinar to be informative and responsive to your needs. The slides I will present include several frequently asked questions that you have submitted to your government technical representatives or grant officers. This webinar is one hour long. If there's time at the end of the presentation to open up the floor for audience questions, I'll be happy to do so. But please be assured that if you have any match-related questions that are not addressed through this session, you may submit your question to your GTR, and we will follow up with you at a later date. So now, I'd like to walk you through our agenda for this session. First, I'll provide you with a background of our match requirements and tie them back to our notice of funding availability. I'll share with you HUD's Office of General Counsel's expectations of the Office of Sustainable Housing and Communities and how those expectations tie into three different types of match scenarios that grantees will find themselves in. I'll provide you with an overview of OSHIC's review process as it relates to match budgets and expenditures. And I'll share with you some areas for increased GTR monitoring. Then I'll share with you some match data analysis results um, and provide you with a summary of those results, some expenditure burn rates, and provide you with an overview of some reporting issues that we were able to identify through our recent analysis. I'll conclude this session with a series of frequently asked questions, and as mentioned earlier, uh, if there's time remaining at the end, we'll open it up uh, for questions from the audience. So starting with the background, many of you know that match requirements were included in the notice of funding availabilities that were published for both the community challenge grant programs as well as the regional planning grant programs in 2010 and 2011. There's some key language I'd like to point out to you that highlights our expectations and the regulations tied to match requirements. In the 2010 notices of funding availability uh, for all cohorts awarded in that fiscal year, the language in our NOFAs read as follows. Cash contributions may come from any combination of local, state, and or federal funds and or private and philanthropic contributions dedicated to the express purposes of this proposal. This language led many uh, staff members and grantees to 
uh, believe that federal uh, funds from other uh, grant streams could be used as match to our program. Um, some additional research occurred shortly after the 2010 NOFAs were published, and then the language in the 2011 NOFAs was slightly modified to include the following language. Federal dollars will not count toward leverage unless otherwise permitted by that program's authorizing statute. I want to highlight the contrast between the language uh, that addresses match contributions uh, up front here because it has implications on OSHIC's approach uh, to responding to the variety of scenarios that our grantees will find themselves in. Uh, at the bottom of this slide, you will be able to click on the variety of icons that you see presented here, and you'll be able to open those NOFAs if you'd like to do additional research yourself. So the next question that we seek to answer here when taking a closer look at the requirements for match is, what are the legal requirements for federal match? Um, to answer this question, we refer you to OMB circulars A87 and A110. And in both of these circulars, which apply to the variety of grantees that are included in our programs, um, you will see that the basic guidelines are very consistent. Essentially, in both of the OMB circulars, it's very clear that ex except as specifically provided by federal law or regulation, federal funds cannot be used as match against another federal program. Um, in other words, the only condition under which federal funding may be used as match for another federal program is if the statutory language for that funding stream directly states that the funds can be used as match for other federal programs. If the statute in the federal funding program's language does not explicitly include that language allowing it, the assumption is that it is not allowable. Over the course of the last several months, OSHIC has worked very closely with its Office of General Counsel to obtain clarification about what expectations they have of our office, which then in turn guide our efforts and expectations of grantees as we approach these match issues. So the Office of General Counsel has provided our office with three general expectations, which I'll walk you through here. The first is that any budgeted match contributions that originated from another federal program that did not have authorizing language in its statute to permit the use of those funds as match will be removed from your budget. So for FY 2010 and 2011 grantees who may have submitted a budget previously to OSHAC and we accepted it, we must now, we are expected now to go back and remove those sources of federal match contributions from your budgets. The second expectation is that any expenditures that grantees have reported and sought to include and as contributions of match expenditures must actually be removed from your expenditure count. So only in the case where you tried to report uh, and count unauthorized federal sources as your match contribution will go back and we'll need to remove those amounts. Uh, and in some cases, we may require you to identify another source of match funding to compensate for that loss. Finally, OSHIC is expected to analyze overall match expenditure patterns uh, through taking a closer look at your match burn rates to determine if your burn rates are low, on track, or high. Low match expenditures uh, may result in a request for individual grantees to submit corrective action plans uh, and uh, possibly identify additional sources of funding to offset the difference. Depending on the particular circumstances involving low match expenditures, some grantees' risk ratings may be elevated uh, and or your budgets may be renegotiated. 
Uh, what's good about this approach, actually, especially with regard to that third expectation, is that it's very much consistent with uh, OSHIC's approach to risk-based grant monitoring to date. And I'd like to uh, point out the PowerPoint presentation that's linked to this particular slide at the bottom here. Uh, and that PowerPoint presentation was presented at the 2012 grantee convening meeting. And you may see that uh, this approach is very much an extension of our previous approach in the past. So based on those general expectations that have been placed upon OSHIC, we sat down and determined that there were three main match scenarios that grantees may find themselves in. The first ha uh, relates to FY 2010 Community Challenge and Regional Planning grantees that may find themselves in a situation where you have unauthorized federal sources of funding being used as match. So we'll provide you with sort of our logic and our reasoning for how we intend to respond to those situations with a little more detail in the following slides. The second scenario pertains to FY 2011 Community Challenge and Regional Planning grantees that also have uh, found themselves in a situation where they have been including unauthorized sources of federal match. Now, we make this distinction between these two types of scenarios because of that contrast in the language I referenced earlier in the notices of funding availability. Our response to the same issue will actually be different across those two cohorts. And in a moment, I'll explain to you how that, how that response will be different. And finally, the third scenario applies to all grantees from all cohorts that have non-federal fund issues. Essentially, this third scenario refers to grantees who um, just generally are exhibiting low match expenditures, but those match expenditures are coming from authorized or allowable sources of match contributions. Um, it is possible for a grantee to uh, fall into more than one of these categories. So for example, uh, some grantees may have a variety of match sources um, built into their projects. They may have some unauthorized federal funds if they're an FY 2010 grantee, and they may also have low match expenditures from allowable sources. And in those cases, OSHIC will be very deliberate and precise about how it applies its logic and methodology for responding to grantees and using that methodology only to aspects or portions of grantees' budgets um, at where they are most applicable. So let's take a closer look at match scenario one. As I mentioned earlier, these are the FY 2010 grantees uh, that have included unauthorized sources of uh, federal match funding into their budgets. So for our response, as I mentioned earlier, is that we must go into those budgets and remove those unauthorized sources of match funding. After we remove those uh, match uh, amounts from your budget, some of you may have a, an overall match commitment amount that drops to below 20%. And others of you will have a match commitment amount that is maintained above 20% even after we remove it. Our response to all grantees, regardless of whether they drop to below 20% or remain above 20%, will be the same. We're expected to request from grantees that they make a good faith effort to identify a different source of, of funding, an allowable source of funding, to compensate for that loss and that difference. If this is not feasible and the grantee has made a good faith effort to attempt to uh, meet the entire commitment amount that was established in the original cooperative agreement, OSHIC will take the following actions. Um, we will reach back out to you and modify your cooperative agreement to make an adjustment to your overall match commitment amount. Uh, and, uh, and the next step for this situation is that there would be no elevation in your risk designation. And the reason why there would be no elevation in your risk designation 
uh, ties back to that language in the 2010 NOFAs. Uh, again, the, the language was unclear. A lot of grantees uh, believed that uh, unauthorized or federal sources of uh, match contribution was acceptable. Uh, and because that language in the NOFA was not as clear as it could be, uh, we ensured that your risk designation would not be elevated as a result of removing those funds. Now, our response to the same issue with the 2010 grantees is going to be slightly different, again, going back to the language in the 2011 NOFAs. So the second match scenario applies to 2011 grantees that have been using unauthorized federal funds as match. Our response will be the same. We are obligated to reach back out to you and remove those uh, amounts of match uh, commitments and expenditures from your budgets and reports. Uh, and again, the second level response will be the same. You'll be asked to identify a new source of match funding from an allowable source or um, identify increased match contributions from an existing source. If you're unable to compensate or offset that difference uh, because of this removal of unauthorized funds, then OSHIC is obligated uh, to elevate your risk rating. And the reason why our response will be different for the 2011 grantees is because the language in the NOFA explicitly stated that unless otherwise and um, indicated by statute, those federal funds cannot be used as match contributions. Um, and in that fine print at the very bottom of this slide, uh, that language also includes uh, a stipulation that depending on the uh, actual specifics of a grant, OSHIC may uh, reduce your overall HUD award amount um, as a result of uh, that unauthorized use of federal funds. And finally, the third match scenario pertains to low match expenditures from authorized sources of funding. Uh, and so this applies to all, all grantees from all cohorts. Uh, OSHIC has established burn rate thresholds to help identify the point at which a grantee's project may be exhibiting problematic uh, expenditure patterns with their match funding. So for the FY 2010 grantees, OSHIC determines that a grantee is exhibiting low match uh, spending if they have a burn rate that is less than 70 percent. Uh, for FY 2011 grantees, the threshold is 60%. So if a, an FY 11 grantee has a burn rate of less than 60%, that is a flag uh, for our office. And uh, we will uh, be notifying you that uh, our office is concerned by uh, the, the uh, rate of expenditures. Uh, and I know a lot of you have questions about what the burn rate is and how it's calculated. Uh, I, in a few slides, I'll be able to walk you through what a burn rate means so that we can uh, work together on uh, solving uh, any of these issues. So once we've identified that a grantee has, in fact, uh, uh, low uh, match expenditures, uh, you will be asked to uh, increase your match expenditures either through existing match sources or, or identifying new sources of uh, match contributions. If you're unable to increase your match expenditures in a manner that suggests you will meet your overall match commitment established in your cooperative agreement, uh, then OSHIC is obligated to raise your risk rating as a result of that, as it is uh, um, an indication of some kind of problem or programmatic deficiency. Uh, again, in certain circumstances, depending on the, the specific grant project and, and how severe the problems are, OSHIC may also uh, need to reduce your uh, overall uh, HUD award amount as well. 
So I mentioned earlier that one of the expectations that the Office of General Counsel has of our office is to ensure that we uh, conduct a uh, very methodical review of match expenditures and respond to any identified issues in a systematic, systematic manner. So we've identified uh, an action plan that started uh, being implemented in March of 2013, and we anticipate uh, the major milestones for this action plan to conclude by June uh, or maybe even July of 2013. So uh, our major um, milestones in this process uh, started in May uh, when we sent out a notification letter to all of you uh, indicating that we will be conducting a match uh, review and uh, reaching back out to you to notify you of any issues uh, we identify through that process. In early to mid-April, um, your GTR uh, began conducting increased monitoring of your match sources and expenditures. Many of you have, well, all of you uh, should have received a, a, an email from your GTR requesting uh, five or six uh, pieces of information that would allow them to monitor your match sources and expenditures a little closely. Um, and by late April, uh, we uh, had targeted the match analysis to be completed uh, and for our grant officers to send out letters to grantees um, uh, that have exhibited issues either with low match spending or uh, the utilization of unauthorized sources of federal match. Um, because we have not received as many uh, responses to the GTR monitoring questions as we had hoped at this point. Uh, we are about two weeks off of this timeline, and we hope that grantees will respond to those questions very soon uh, so that our grant officers can uh, send out the next wave of communications, uh, hopefully in the beginning of May, no later than the middle of this month. And finally, between May and June, uh, we anticipate our grant officers making any amendments to your cooperative agreements and budgets to remove unauthorized sources or make adjustments to your match commitment amounts. Um, in certain cases, your GTR and or your grant officer will work with you also uh, to um, uh, attempt to avoid any elevation in your risk rating. Uh, and if there is an elevation in your risk rating, we anticipate that occurring in the months of May and June of this year. I want to take a quick moment to lay out those five or six questions that your government technical representative sent to you. Um, and this happened uh, about a couple of weeks ago, so uh, you should hopefully be familiar with these questions. Essentially, your government technical representative is seeking to gather information about whether you are using any other federal funds as a source of match contribution, and if you obtained HUD, HUD's approval to do so. Uh, we're interested in learning which federal agencies and funding streams or programs were used and whether or not you were able to determine that uh, there was authorizing language in statute uh, permitting the use of those federal funds as match. Uh, for any match commitments uh, or expenditures that you made uh, that originated from another federal source, we are also interested in um, getting the amount expended to date for those particular funding streams. Also with that request uh, from your GTRs, uh, they were seeking to verify your most recent SF-425, which is the federal financial form, or your Part 3 reimbursement request form. Specifically, uh, we're interested in taking a look at your cumulative match expenditures and confirming with as much certainty as possible that the figure is accurate. Uh, those accurate figures are absolutely critical to ensuring that our match data analysis uh, is uh, accurate and when we make any adjustments to your risk ratings, it's based on the best possible information available to us. If you haven't responded to these questions uh, from your GTRs, 
Again, I strongly encourage you to uh, respond. Uh, and if you can uh, CC uh, Eva Tang, who is our on-site contractor, who is uh, spearheading a lot of the data analysis here, uh, that will streamline efforts on our end. And her email address is included in that blue box uh, uh, in this slide. I'd like to share with you some preliminary results from our match data analysis. This first uh, set of results uh, summarizes the responses to those GTR monitoring questions that I just walked you through. Again, I indicated that we didn't receive all of our responses from, one, from the 153 grantees yet, but we're happy to provide you with updated data once it's more complete. But based on this initial picture, uh, as of April 18th, uh, we learned that we've received 75 out of 153 updates from grantees. This represents about a 50% response rate. And again, we're hoping to get that response rate higher. Of those who responded, we found that 38 grantees, or 48% of respondents, reported no use of other federal funding. We also found that 14 grantees, or 19% of respondents, reported using CDBG or other HUD funds as sources of match. And finally, we learned that 21 grantees, or 28% of respondents, reported using DOT or other federal funding from a variety of other agencies. This data is incomplete, and the last two bullet points uh, include a duplicate count. So some grantees might fall into both of those categories. Uh, but this gives us a sense of the scope of this issue and the amount of amendments uh, and the nature of the issue and uh, how we need to respond to it. I'd like to share with you um, some information uh, related to uh, more of a backdrop, I should say, uh, to the burn rate data that I'm about to share with you. The uh, burn rate analysis was based on information that we gathered from all of the grantees. So we actually have a complete universe of information for uh, this analysis. Um, the match expenditure analysis was completed on March 25th. And the data from, for the match expenditure analysis came from grantees' most recent SF-425 report submissions, which covered the period through January 31st. The measure used to analyze expenditure trends, as I mentioned, is the burn rate. And I realize that some of you have questions about what the burn rate is and why it's being used. The burn rate is the rate at which the project budget is being burned or spent. The burn rate is used to determine whether the project is expected to close out early, on time, or late. And so it's based on projections. A very simplified formula for the burn rate is listed here as the third bullet point about halfway down this slide. So we take your total expenditures and we divide it by a per month expenditure target. The per month expenditure target is calculated by taking all of the, um, your entire commitment amount and dividing it by the number of months in the performance period. So an ideal burn rate is going to be 100%. A 100% burn rate indicates that the grant is expected to be fully expended by the end of the performance period. The burn rate is not the percentage of funds expended, although it's very easy to confuse the rate for this. As I mentioned very briefly earlier, the thresholds that we use for the purposes of our, of our risk designations are 70% for the 2010 grantees, and 60% for the 2011 grantees. The reason why we have not established a 100% target burn rate for all of the grantees is because we want to take into account the ramp up period at the start of the projects so that um, you, we, we're placing realistic expectations on you for your match expenditures. So this next slide provides some data for you on the 2010 grantees relative to that 70% threshold. So as I indicated, if a grantee's match expenditure burn rate is less than 70%, 
our office will flag that and reach out to you and, and notify you of our concern. For the FY2010 grantees, the majority are actually either meeting that burn rate threshold or exceeding it significantly. The good news is that we have 19.5% of the 2010 grantees, uh, which are represented by 17 grantees, who have a burn rate that's right in the range that we like to see. They have a match expenditure burn rate of between 70 and 100%. We were very pleased to see that 33 grantees, representing 38% of the overall 2010 cohort, actually had a burn rate that exceeded 100%. So these folks are not only on track to meet their match commitment amount in their cooperative agreement, but we anticipate that they'll meet that commitment amount early. And of course, there's never any penalty on exceeding your match commitment amount. Unfortunately, on the other side of the pie chart, you'll see that 31 grantees that represent about 35.6% of the cohort have a burn rate that's below 70%. These are the grantees that will be targeted for notification by our office. We will reach out to you. We want to understand what's going on and how we can get you up to that desired threshold. And finally, we do have 6.9% of the cohort, uh, or six grantees, uh, who were missing data on their SF-425 forms, or they hadn't submitted their 425 forms at the time of this analysis, and so their burn rates are unknown. Next, let's take a look at the FY11 grantees and how they fare relative to the 60% threshold. We see from this pie chart that a very large um, group of grantees relative to the size of the cohort are below the 60% burn rate threshold. Um, 38 grantees, or 60, about 68% of the cohort, is not meeting their threshold. Seven grantees uh, have a burn rate that is right in that range that we like to see, which is between 60% and 100%. And eight grantees have a burn rate that's greater than 100%. And we also have 5.4% of the cohort that uh, have an unknown burn rate to us at this time, either because they were missing data in their financial form or they hadn't submitted their financial form. So we'll be reaching out to those 38 grantees to see what's going on and how we can get those numbers up. This next slide provides you with a little more uh, nuanced breakdown of where the, the grantees fall within more specific ranges. Uh, the red line indicates that burn rate threshold, which is 70% for the 10s and 60% for the 11s. You'll see that we really have a wide range of grantees and where they fall. Uh, we have our high performers that you see listed at the very bottom. We have seven grantees that have a burn rate of 150 to 175%. Uh, I'm looking at the 2010 cohorts. And we even have five that have exceeded a 200% burn rate threshold. 200% burn rate, I should say. Unfortunately, on the other end of the spectrum, we have far too many grantees that have uh, either zero, uh, a zero percent burn rate or a burn rate that's in the range of one to 10 percent or 10 to 20 percent. Uh, those folks are not even near that threshold. So it's much easier for us to work with those grantees who are right on the cusp of the threshold. We can uh, make a concerted effort together and sort of get you up to where you need to be. But for those grantees that are really on the far end of that spectrum, uh, it's going to take uh, some tremendous effort and uh, concerted prioritization to uh, see the movement uh, to, and get the movement to where we want it to be. This next slide shows uh, the same data, but presented slightly differently. You can see a comparison between the 2010 and 2011 grantees. The number of grantees that fall within each one of those burn rate uh, bands or, or ranges. Uh, we see a lot of the 2011 grantees that are on the low end. Uh, we see a lot more 2011s on the low end and uh, 2010s on the high end. Uh, and so that'll just give you a picture of what the cohorts are looking uh, like as a whole. 
This match uh, analysis has revealed to us a couple of uh, reporting challenges that we've identified with grantees, uh, specifically with this form that you see here. This form uh, is the SF-425 form, also known as the Federal Financial Report Form. And this is the official financial, uh, one of the most, one of the official financial records that we use to reconcile your grant project. At the end of your performance period, your grant officers will be reconciling your grant projects down to the penny. And so it's absolutely imperative that the information you report in this form uh, is complete, it's accurate, it's signed by the appropriate authority, uh, and I thought it would be important to take just a moment to talk about some of the issues we came across when we conducted this report so that you'll have a better sense of how to improve your reporting moving forward. So we found that uh, some grantees uh, did not report their match expenditures in that federal financial form. There is a place for you to report those match expenditures, and it's OSHIC's expectation that you do report that expenditure there. Uh, we found that there were discrepancies between figures listed in your 425 form and the cooperative agreement. And I'll talk a little more specifically about the nature of those discrepancies. Uh, but uh, in general, if you have a match commitment amount that you agreed to in your cooperative agreement, that commitment amount should be reported as the same figure in your SF-425 form. If those two numbers are discrepant, that becomes a problem uh, with your report and we need to reconcile that difference. We found uh, a number of calculation errors uh, in the reporting, specifically with uh, remaining match amounts. So your remaining match amount reported in the SF-425 should uh, come out, uh, it should be the difference of your total commitment minus your amount expended. And that remaining difference should be your remaining match amount. And so we found some issues with uh, just the, the calculation of your remaining match amount. In some cases, we uh, received beautiful submissions that were complete, were accurate, were on time, but they were not signed by the authorized organization's representative. Uh, and if it's not signed by your AOR, OSHA cannot accept that report because the AOR uh, is responsible, uh, especially financially, for ensuring that these reports and expenditures in general are being monitored and reviewed before they are submitted to HUD. Uh, and finally, the worst uh, uh, offense of all, uh, if you will, is that some grantees did not submit the report at all. And so we need uh, those reports to be submitted uh, on time and accurately um, and uh, signed by the appropriate authority. So I want to take this piece around discrepancies in match commitment amounts between the SF-425 and the 1044 and take a closer look at it. Your 1044 is your cooperative agreement. We found that uh, the majority of grantees from all cohorts and all fiscal years um, did a very good job of ensuring that the match commitment amounts they, list, they reported in their 425 forms reflected the same amount in their cooperative agreement. So 56.7% uh, of grantees did that. Uh, we found uh, that about 37 percent, or 53 grantees, uh, had uh, discrepancies between the commitment amount in their cooperative agreement and the amount that they reported in their SF-425 form. So for those 53 grantees, we'll be reaching out to you uh, and uh, asking you to help us reconcile that difference to make sure we're all on the same page about what commitment amount you're using. We had seven grantees, as I mentioned, that did not report their match commitment amounts on the 425 form, and then uh, two loan grantees that had not turned in their, their uh, financial forms at all as of the uh, date of this analysis. So the next section of our session uh, today will focus on frequently asked questions. Um, and these are questions that have been forwarded to us uh, by the government technical representatives that work closely with you on your grant projects. Uh, and they also include questions that originated uh, from our grant officers as well. 
these questions uh, represent uh, a theme of questions that our GTRs have heard uh, numerous times from grantees. Uh, and we want to make sure you get some solid answers here. And if you uh, can think of any questions that have not been answered through this portion of the session, uh, we'd be happy to reach out to you at a later time to get you the answers that you need. So one question that some grantees had is, how do I confirm if federal funds can be used as match? Uh, this question sort of originates from uh, the uh, series of analyses that we've begun to conduct around whether or not uh, the, any federal sources of funding are allowable uh, to be used as match. So we'd like to refer you to the three sources listed here on this slide. Um, we encourage you to look up the statutory authorizing language for those other federal programs directly. Um, it's best to uh, take the lead and have a first-hand review of the statutes, uh, especially if there's any question in your mind as to whether or not federal funds can be used. So uh, one excellent resource is the Code of Federal Regulations. And uh, when you obtain this PowerPoint presentation, you can actually click on that link, and it'll take you directly to a place where you can uh, take a look at those um, uh, those resources. Um, you may also take a look at the Federal Register, um, where the uh, federal program is listed, and look up the statutory language there and see if it explicitly allows for it. And finally, you can also reference the notices of funding availability for those other programs and see if there's any explicit language allowing it. Um, if you are unable to obtain the information you need from these sources, you can always contact that other federal funding agency, either their program office or their office of general counsel, and pose the question directly, and they should be able to tell you. The next question um, is, uh, has to do with grantees that are interested in including new sources of match contribution and integrating them into their existing projects. So some grantees are interested in learning what documentation our office needs in order to be able to um, accept that. So we require, um, in all cases, a minimum of two documents, and in some cases, three. So first, we would be looking for a match commitment letter from that other partner or that other source of match contribution. Uh, we need to have assurance in writing that that other partner uh, will be making that commitment, is invested in the project, and we need to see the amount of contribution that that partner or partners are interested in making and investing into the project. We will be looking for an updated 424 CBW, which is uh, just code for a detailed budget. We would want to see how this uh, new match contribution uh, will impact your budget. And in some cases, depending on the request of your grant officer, we may seek a justification narrative where you essentially justify this uh, new match contribution and uh, assure, assure us that it is consistent with your overall project goals and intended outcomes. Um, and that's just about it. If you have a new source of match contribution, those are the documents you would need to focus on. So um, a very common question that we've received from grantees uh, since the inception of our program uh, has to do with match documentation. Uh, so a grantee uh, has posed this question, uh, and that is, how should grantees maintain their match documentation in order to withstand the scrutiny of a single audit? So there are two pieces of relevant regulations that I'd like to refer you to. Um, and uh, they originate from OMB Circular A133, which is a compliance supplement to 2012. It's actually language uh, that is in a supplement to the circular and not the original um, circular. And in that supplement, um, there is language that lists out the suggested audit procedures related to matching funds. 
And so what we encourage grantees to do is take a very close look at the audit procedures uh, related to matching funds and ensure that your records can withstand the type of scrutiny that's listed here. So I'll walk you through this very briefly. Uh, the expectation is that um, you uh, should be able to have documentation that will verify that the required matching contributions were met and ascertain that the sources of matching contributions uh, were from allowable sources. So your records should, again, be able to verify that your match contribution was met and that, they, that those contributions were from allowable sources. Um, your records should be able to corroborate that the values placed on in-kind contributions are in accordance with OMB cost principle circulars, and there's a number of circulars listed here, as well as the terms of the award. Um, I would reference you to those later circulars so that you can um, understand that there are also methodologies tied to how you track in-kind match contributions, and I'll actually get into that in a little more detail in a later slide here. Um, and of course, your match uh, uh, records should be able to demonstrate that uh, you met the cost principle requirements. Um, and there's some language around testing, um, and that will give you a sense of where an auditor is coming from uh, when they take a closer look at your match contributions. The answer to this question continues in the next slide here, um, where we reference uh, OMB Circular A110. And this specific language uh, has to do with documentation regarding in-kind contributions uh, from third parties and how you should maintain your records here. So your records uh, uh, f should be able, if you're including volunteer services, um, your records should document those volunteer services and to the extent feasible, demonstrate that that, that documentation is supported by the same methods used by you uh, for your own employees. Uh, and so the same way that you would value the work uh, or similar work uh, of your employees for documentation purposes, you would do the same thing for your volunteer uh, efforts or contributions. And they would, again, have to be consistent with the cost principles. So they have to be reasonable, allowable, and allocable. Um, and you must also document the basis for determining the valuation of personal services. Uh, so if you are in a position, and I know many of you are, where you have to um, establish a value or a rate for an in-kind contribution as match, um, you uh, will need to demonstrate in your records and document the method by which you establish that value. Uh, uh, that's a very critical part of ensuring that your project can withstand the scrutiny of a single audit, especially on this uh, issue of match documentation. So a similar uh, uh, question to uh, the previous one is, uh, what expectations does OSHIC have of grantees to document their match expenditures? Well, our expectations are uh, very uh, consistent with 24 CFR Part 85, which is the administrative requirements for grants and cooperative agreements to state, local, and federally recognized Indian tribal governments. Um, uh, the same sort of rule will apply as well to research institutions and universities. Our expectation is that you are able to put together your match records in a manner that would allow a, a neutral, independent third party to pick up those records and verify that both your match contributions and your subgrantee or contractor's contributions uh, have been made to the commitment amount. So they should be able to verify uh, that those 
uh, that work or those purchases or those services occurred at the level you're claiming uh, they uh, have been expended at. Um, the records need to show the value that you placed on those third-party in-kind contributions and how you derive that value. I can't emphasize that point enough because it really is a strong theme throughout all of the regulations and the circulars. Uh, the federal government expects grantees to be able to document and demonstrate how you derived the value of your in-kind contributions. Um, and for volunteer services, again, this is consistent with uh, some of the earlier slides. Um, the, our expectation is that you would, uh, your documentation will support the uh, same methods that, the, that your organization uses to support the allocability of regular personnel costs. And I know that's a lot of heavy regulation, sort of legal language being used here. But if any of you have additional questions, I encourage you to reach out to your GTR or uh, take a closer look at the regulations and really take your time to uh, have a closer understanding of, of what those expectations are. A very common question uh, that has emerged uh, among grantees uh, as soon as we started taking a closer look at these uh, match uh, data sources uh, and contributions is whether grantees need to drill down into their subgrantees or consultants to ensure that the subgrantees or consultants are also not using match with unauthorized federal funding. The simple answer to this question is yes. OSHIC's expectation is that grantees should be reaching out to subgrantees and contractors to ensure that any match contributions they are claiming uh, to be included in as a match expenditure in your project are not coming from unauthorized federal funding. The reason for this is because of flow down provisions uh, that uh, are applicable to all levels of funding. So even if you uh, have uh, made awards two or even three levels removed from the prime grantee who is the grant recipient, um, all of your partners and subgrantee uh, grantees and contractors need to adhere to the same regulation. Uh, you cannot count um, an unauthorized source of federal funding as a match contribution for this grant. Uh, and there's a lot of language in the section um, focused on records in 24 CFR Part 85 that uh, will uh, support that. Uh, so if you haven't reached out to your uh, subgrantees or contractors to uh, take a closer look at it and remove those expenditures, uh, now's the time to do that. The next question has to do with whether uh, match travel has to meet the GSA per diem requirements. This is actually a complex question. Actually, it's a simple question with a complex response. Um, so the, the simple uh, answer is that uh, any uh, match contributions uh, that a partner or yourself seeks to include as a match expenditure uh, really should follow the uh, regulations and guidelines for reasonability, uh, allocability, um, and allowability. So um, first and foremost, that's going to be the most important um, response uh, or lens through which to view this question. Um, and then I would refer uh, you all to take a look at OMB Circular A87, which breaks down travel costs. And it, and it um, I'm not going to read through this whole paragraph, but just highlight that uh, certain costs may be charged on an actual cost basis, on a per diem basis, um, or a mileage basis in lieu of actual costs incurred, or a combination of the two, provided the method used is applied to an entire trip and not to selected days of the trip. 
And so what this will suggest is that um, there are different approaches for how you actually calculate the uh, cost for travel. Um, and the federal government will defer to a grantee if they have an established policy uh, for uh, calculating travel costs. And in the absence of a travel, um, a travel policy, I'll just switch to the next slide because there's a lot of language here. In the absence of a travel policy, uh, the grantee is uh, responsible or required, I should say, to stick to the per diem uh, uh, amount established by GSA. So in sum, uh, grantees are expected to ensure that the rules governing uh, their match expenditures for travel uh, are consistent with uh, those expectations that we have of your federal award. Uh, and then within that, you'll see that, that there are a couple of acceptable ways of calculating travel costs for the purposes of match. Another question that uh, came up uh, for us in preparation of this webinar is if, can, if grantees can establish a generic rate for the purposes of tracking in-kind match contributions incurred through scenario planning workshops. The short answer to this question is yes. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, in reference to uh, that slew of other uh, circulars and regulations, uh, what the federal government is most interested in seeing, especially in your documentation regarding in-kind match contributions, is that you document and demonstrate the method that you used for determining the value, how you valued participation in those scenario planning workshops. So, so long as you are able to document your method for valuing that contribution, and then you apply that method to, uh, you apply that method consistently. Uh, so if you have multiple scenario planning workshops, uh, essentially you apply that methodology consistently to uh, counting match expenditures for all three scenario planning workshops, that would uh, put you in a very strong position. Um, our last frequently asked question uh, is similar to the previous one. Um, um, we had a grantee indicate that they had great attendance and participation at the 750 Road Show Work Group meetings and two regional summits. Uh, the grantee indicated that this represents a significant level of match, and does HUD have a preferred way for us to account for this match? Um, and I think I hit this point in different ways and from different perspectives um, in previous slides, but uh, I'll summarize essentially the same points uh, uh, in order to answer this question. Our primary focus uh, with uh, documenting match contributions in a variety of contexts in which those match contributions arise is that first and foremost, those costs are allowable, reasonable, and allocable. Um, we are interested in seeing that your match records are maintained in a manner that's consistent with OMB Circular A133 and those additional supplements as well as 24 CFR Part 85. Uh, we uh, are seeking to see that the costs and third-party in-kind contributions um, satisfy a cost-sharing or match requirement uh, are verifiable from your records, uh, consistent with those earlier regulations that I pointed out, and that your records show how the value placed on third-party in-kind contributions were derived. And uh, if you are incorporating volunteer services, essentially your documentation should support the same methods that you use within your own organization for your own personnel. Um, and uh, that concludes uh, the portion of our session with frequently asked questions. And I do want to say that if you have additional questions, please research these circulars and regulations. And feel free to reach out to your uh, government technical representatives. Uh, and we'll be happy to follow up this session with some additional questions. 
Um, at this point, I just want to express uh, our uh, uh, deep thanks to uh, all of you, first and foremost, for the tremendous work that you're doing uh, and, and the hard work that it takes to really leverage a variety of partnerships throughout this uh, country and in so many communities. And I'd also like to express very special thanks to all of these uh, HUD staff members that are listed here in this uh, slide, uh, especially Stephen Shepard, who did an, a tremendous amount of work to compile and gather this data, Eva Tang, Leanne Richardson, who worked very closely with us from our Office of General Counsel, of course, Dwayne Marsh, uh, the Sustainable Communities Initiative Division Director, and the wonderful team of government technical representatives and grant officers who uh, work so hard on this initiative on a daily basis, just like all of you. So with that said, I'd just like to thank you and wish you all the very best, and we look forward to working closely with you in the coming months.